find out how God has prescribed we should use his word. He has given us the guidelines, just like he gave to the Levites. He's given us guidelines as to how we're allowed to use the Bible, okay? And if we follow those guidelines, he will keep us safe, and we will be using the sword of the Spirit. Otherwise, we're just going to be deceiving ourselves, all right? So let's find out what the prescriptions are. First of all, number one, the number one rule when you're handling the Holy Word of God is you do not add to his words. Proverbs 30, 5 through 6 says, Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. Understand that liars don't enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay? So we don't want that rebuke. It's a very serious thing to add to his words. Okay? And then again, we just read that that scripture out of Revelation 22, which tells us if we add to his words, he will add to us all the plagues in the book of Revelation. Ever read Revelation? That's not something you want to happen to you. Okay? So... We need to be very careful not to add to God's words. Now, we're very tricky in the way that we do this, okay? <clears throat> yeah, some people like Joseph Smith are just brazen and they say, you know, I have a revelation and the Bible's wrong the way it's written, so I'm going to rewrite it. Yeah, there are people that are that crazy, all right? But most of us, we, we are a little bit more subtle about the way that we do this, okay? About the way we disguise our true motivations. We disguise the fact that we're using our own words instead of God's word. We're adding to his words, okay? The way that we usually do this, in one form or another, is we take a scripture, okay? And then we springboard off of it, to, and we use logic to come to a conclusion. And the conclusion isn't in the Bible, the way that we state the conclusion. But we figure, since it's logical, and since we started with scripture, it must be right. Eh, incorrect answer. Listen to me. If your conclusion is not in the Bible, it's not because God forgot to put it in there. It's because it's not supposed to be in there. And when you speak your conclusions that you base on the Bible with the same authority as the Word of God, well, yeah, the Word of God is true, and this also must be true because it's logical. <laughs> what you're doing is you're exalting your own words and you're adding to God's Word. You're giving your words the same authority that you give the word of God. And sometimes we even exalt it above that. Okay? Very serious thing. We don't want to do that. Now, the second prescription that we are given as to how to handle the word of God is that we are not to take away from his words. If we do, our inheritance in the city of God will be taken away. Okay? And this is how this usually works, you guys. We use scripture, springboard off of it, use logic to come to a conclusion. Now, by the way, the Bible tells us that God's wisdom will frustrate our logic. It will frustrate our intelligence. So don't assume that just because your conclusion is logical to you, that it's God's ways. God said, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. And the Bible says that we are to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and to lean not on our own understanding. Don't put so much, don't put so much faith in your own logic and your own, your own intelligence, okay? Just because it makes sense to you doesn't mean that it's godly. Just because you think it's right does not mean that God thinks it's right. The only way you can test something to know if it's what God thinks is if it's written expressly in the word of God, okay? So we springboard and we come to this conclusion that's not in the Bible. And then, because our words are not flawless, okay, we find another scripture. Another scripture over here that contradicts our conclusion, okay? So you know what we do? Because it doesn't make sense to us and because it doesn't agree with what we already understand and the conclusions we've come to, we find a way to diminish this scripture that disagrees with our conclusion. We find a way to say, oh, that doesn't really mean what it says. Oh, that's a little bit, that's just cultural, you know. That was just for that culture. It's not for me. Or Jesus didn't mean it literally, you know. There are some places that just really cut us to the quick and, and we we try to dull that knife, you know, because it doesn't make sense to us and it doesn't agree with our conclusions and what we want to believe. When Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on this earth, well, that's one that we really try to find a way to get around, isn't it? 
That's, that's hard, man. You mean what? I can't have a 401k? I can't have a bank account? What does that mean? I know every preacher on the planet will probably tell you that that doesn't mean that, but I'm not going to tell you that. It says don't store up treasures for yourself on the earth. That's what it says, and that's what it means. That's all I'm going to say about that. Okay? When you find these places that don't make sense to you and don't agree with your conclusions, then it's very important for you to identify what you're doing because if you diminish that scripture and you say it doesn't really mean what it says, it's not really as sharp as it seems to be, you are taking away from God's word. You are exalting your own word above his, and you're going to be judged for it. So the number one thing that we don't want to do is add to his words. Do not add to God's words. Second thing that God says, do not take away from his words, okay? And the number three is that we're not going to express spiritual truths in human words, all right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, it gives us this prescription. It says, this is what we speak, not in words taught by us by human wisdom, but in words taught us by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. Now, listen, I know that we all, as Christians, think that our words are very spiritual, okay? And if we're talking about God and we're talking about the Bible, we think that we're talking spiritual words. But no, that's not the case, okay? The Bible tells us what spiritual words are. Jesus said this, my spirit, my words are spirit and they are life. Okay. So Jesus identified that his word is the only thing that's spirit. Okay. Now, whenever we add to God's words or expound on God's words, then that's not spiritual. Those aren't spiritual words. Okay. Okay. It's only spiritual if we get it directly out of the Bible. So this is what this is saying, okay? If we think we have a spiritual truth, if we have been given a revelation by God, or we think we have a deep spiritual insight into the Bible, then we're not going to express that spiritual truth in human words. We're not going to express it in our own words, okay? We're going to express those truths in words that are in the Bible because you see the word of God is flawless. And if he comes to you with a revelation, you are going to find it in the word of God, in the written word of God. The Bible says don't despise prophecies, but test everything and hold on to the good. This is the standard by which we test it. If we can find it expressly written in the Bible, then it's from God. If we can't, we have no way of knowing if it's from God or not. Okay? And you cannot give it the authority of the word of God. We express spiritual truths in spiritual words. Anybody who comes to you expressing what they claim to be a spiritual truth in words of human wisdom that you can't find in the Bible is lying to you. And I don't care how good their intentions are. The result is that you're going to be deceived. It's going to lead you down down the wrong path. It's going to get your focus in a place that, um, that God didn't want it in. So we don't want to express spiritual truths in human words. All right. And number four, we are not to exalt tradition above the word of God, okay? Now, in Colossians 2.8, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. Now, understand that Christ is the word of God, okay? So, the Bible tells us, you know, that tradition is not exalted to the level of Christ. It is not to be exalted, All right. And we see in Matthew chapter 15 where Jesus actually rebukes the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, because now understand that these were the religious leaders of the day. Okay, they have been entrusted with all the scriptures. And and I mean, the, the temple of God was there. I mean, if anybody had a right to claim that their tradition was holy, it was the Pharisees. Okay. So if you think that you have the right to to claim that your church tradition is holy, you need to listen to this rebuke because you know what Jesus said to these guys? He he told them, he rebuked them because he said, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your traditions. He gave them an example of how they had exalted one of their traditions um, to the place where somebody had to disobey the word of God to do what their tradition said, okay? Now understand what that is. You think that if you think that's a holy thing, that is not a holy thing. It is the definition of unholy. It is the exalting of something else above Christ. All right. That's called an idol. It's called the spirit of Antichrist. Anything that exalts itself above Christ and demands that it be worshipped over Christ and obeyed over God's holy word is the spirit of Antichrist. Okay. Now, I know that some of your churches even have in their doctrine statements 
that church tradition, I know that the Catholic Church is like this, that church tradition has the same authority as the Word of God. That is a lie from the pit of hell. And I'm not saying that to you to offend you, but listen, if you want to argue with me, you're going to have to argue with God's Holy Word. Understand this. If your church says one thing and the Word of God says another, you've got a choice to make. You've got to choose which you're going to bow to. And you know what most humans do? We bow to the tradition because it's what we know. We figure, hey, these are holy people. These are priests. These are preachers. They wouldn't tell me that it was right if there wasn't a reason. There's probably some reason that I don't understand that scripture correctly. Surely they wouldn't just, you know, tell us to do something that's against scripture. You guys, don't exalt your religious leaders to the place of Christ. But understand that they're just men. They're just people, okay? And I'm not saying that they don't deserve any respect at all, but I am saying that Jesus is the only one who deserves to be bowed to. All right? When you're given a choice, you better make the right choice. Read the Bible. Don't take anybody's word for what it says. And don't give anybody that authority because men are fallible. Tradition is fallible. Do you understand that church tradition is created over time by the habits of men? Yeah, there are men that are in spiritual authority. But have we not seen that some men that are in spiritual authority can do vile, evil things? Have we not seen this in the Catholic Church? Priests who defile and and harm young boys, molest them? Is that a holy thing? And yet these are the same people that you're given the authority to establish a tradition that's going to exalt itself above the Word of God? No, 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 no. Human tradition is not a clean, holy, flawless thing. The Word of God is. Stick with the Word of God and you will be judged innocent. Okay, this is what you're going to be judged on. Not a book of tradition. This is the book you're going to be judged on. Read it, my brothers and sisters. Just read it and obey what it says. So to recap, we have four prescriptions that God has given to us as to how we are to handle His Holy Word. Number one, do not add to His words. Number two, do not take away from His words. Number three, we express spiritual truths in words that we find in the Bible, not in our own words. And number four, we are not to exalt tradition over the authority of the Word of God. We need to learn to handle the Word of God correctly so that we are not judged on Judgment Day for handling it as a common thing, okay? Um, we need to take the exhortation that Paul gave to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 15-17, through 17, it says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the Word of Truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Now there is a reason that God is so adamant that his holy word be handled in the way that he prescribed. He is so adamant about the fact that we are not to use our own sword, okay? Now we don't have to understand that reason in order to obey him, right? We need to obey even when we don't understand. However, we do speak a message of wisdom to the wise. And there is a wisdom in, um, in God's way of doing war, okay? I'm going to read to you in Hebrews 4, 12 again, where it tells us what this weapon is for, what the Word of God is, has come to do, okay? It says, The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart, okay? So we see that this is a very precise tool with which Jesus goes in and cuts to the very depth of our heart and it, and he goes in and what what the word of God does is it goes in and it judges the difference between what is evil and what is good, okay? And then it separates the evil off from the good so that the good can be saved because as long as they're intermingled, the good is going to be lost with the bad when it's judged, Okay? But if he can go in and cut it away like a master surgeon, it says that it's so precise that that it's even able to to judge between the thoughts and intentions of our heart, between our soul and our spirit, you know? So God's word is very effective at doing that, and he is the only one who has that kind of wisdom. You think about it. Do you want just any old person doing heart surgery on you? No, no. And if you're not an expert and you've got to do heart surgery on somebody, you better have a heart surgeon right behind you 
guiding your hand, right? And telling you what to do. Because if you don't, you're going to lose some good tissue and you'll probably even kill the person that you're trying to heal, right? This is a very serious process being saved from our sin. And we need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, okay? And we see that it's the same in the body of Christ. God's word comes to separate the evil from the good, okay? We see that in the judgment of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. Um, Jesus judges between who are the sons of, the, of Satan, and he sends those people to hell, and he judges which are the sheep. He separates the sheep from the goats, okay? So he does the same thing in the body of Christ. And understand that his weapon is very powerful. Remember, the weapons of our warfare, um, the, the weapons that we use, have divine power to demolish strongholds, okay? Do you know what a stronghold is? A stronghold is a place where evil has crept in to our hearts or into the body of Christ, and it has woven its way in, and it's gotten a foothold, okay? And it's in there, man. It's, it's woven in. It's like a disease in our heart, okay? It's woven in. It's going to take a master surgeon to get that out without killing the person. Do you understand that? So if we use our own sword... Do you understand that if we look around and we decide that we're going to start using our own sword for this purpose, we are going to have a disastrous result. Now in Matthew 13, starting in verse 24, Jesus tells us a story to try to illustrate this point to us, okay? Why it's important that we don't judge using our own ways, our own words, our own sword, okay? The reason that it's important that we let the word of God do the judging, all right? And um, it's a parable and he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Okay, understand this. That there were weeds and wheat growing up together, and those represent the sons of the kingdom, that was the wheat, and the sons of Satan. That was, those were the weeds, all right? And they're growing up together. And what do the servants do? They come and they say, hey, don't you want us to pull out those weeds? Come on, man. <laughs> don't you think we need to pull up the weeds? And God says, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Because you see, you guys, each one of those stalks of wheat represents one of his children. Please understand that. And if you have kids, you understand that it doesn't matter if you have 20 kids. If you lose even one, if even one of those kids dies, there, there is no way to ever, ever replace that child. They are priceless. And he is not willing that even one of them be lost. Now, if the servants would have had their way, they would have gone and judged prematurely. They would have gone and tried to, to yank out the weeds prematurely. But according to God's wisdom, God knew the way to cut and judge in such a way that not even one of those stalks of wheat, of those sons or daughters of the kingdom, will be lost. Now understand this, you guys. This applies to us. If you look around the church today, anybody looking around and seeing any weeds? Okay? Anybody looking around and seeing any weeds mixed in with this wheat? The church of God right now, we've, we've got the sons of Satan mixed in with the sons of the kingdom, right? But what we're tempted to do is pick up our own words and say, you know what, I think it's time to do a little judgment, all right? I think it's time to do a little cutting away. We got some weeds over here. I think we need to start pulling some weeds. But it's not according to God's wisdom, and it's not using God's word. It's using our own way of waging war and our own weapons, Okay, now understand what you are doing when you do this. If you divide, listen very carefully, brothers and sisters, please listen to me. If you divide from another brother or sister in Christ based upon your own words or the traditions of your church, 
or based upon your wisdom and the way you think that this war needs to be waged, you are going to be guilty before God of cutting one member of the bride of Christ from another. Do you understand what that means? The Bible says that we are all one body in the body of Christ. The bride of Christ is one body. And if you go in and you start separating off people that aren't supposed to be separated or in the process of judging one person that you think is evil, another person may fall down in sin because they didn't understand what you're doing because it wasn't the word of God. It wasn't flawless. If you start, you start cutting away members of, of the bride of Christ, it is like going in and pulling out your sword and hacking away and you're saying, oh yeah, I'm going to cut that enemy away from her. And when you're done, oh expert swordsman, you've got a mangled bride because you know what you did in the process? You cut off her hand. You cut off her foot. You slashed her in the side. And do you know what's going to happen to you if you do this? Woe to you. Woe to you if you separate from another brother or sister because you're Catholic and they're not, or you're Baptist and they're not. Woe to you. Those are men's words. They are not God's words. Let God's word do the separating. Woe to you if you say, well, you know, I read the KJV and you read the NIV, so we can't be part of each other. How dare you? How dare you divide the body of Christ? Do you understand? That Christ gave himself up for the bride. That he valued her life even more than his own. Do you understand that if he is going to judge you for approaching his holiness in a way that's not prescribed? (laughs) For disrespecting him? Do you know what he's going to do to you if you have cut his bride into pieces? You do not want to be standing before the judgment throne of God with the blood of the bride on your hands. You're talking about his girl, and you're not going to get away with it. Don't take it lightly. Jesus said, there are so many things that cause people to sin. Oh, but woe to him. Through who those things come, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than if he were to make even one of my little ones stumble. You guys, we've got to learn that there's going to be a judgment for us if we don't use the word of God in the way that it's prescribed. We've got to learn to bow our knee to the holy authority of the word of God. Now, if you are really interested in seeing the bride of Christ cleansed, if you are really interested in seeing God do his work in his bride, let me tell you how it's going to happen. In Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, it says this. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Do you understand that this tells us how the church of God is going to be cleaned up? Look around. Do you see the spotless, perfect bride anywhere? (laughs) But it is going to happen, you guys. He is coming back for a bride that is without spot or wrinkle. There's only one way it's going to happen. It's through his word. She is washed when we speak the word of God. Do you understand that as a teacher or a preacher or an evangelist or a Christian, the most important thing you can do is read the word of God to your people? Do you understand that we spend more time talking about the Bible than we do reading the Bible? But it's not our words. It's not our deep spiritual insights that are going to clean her up. It says that Christ himself washes her, and he washes her with his word. So if we want to see her clean, we've got to start speaking his words only, and we've got to take out our words. Now, when we add our words to God's word, this is what we do, you guys. We add all of our our great insights to God's word, and we get up and we, you know, we teach it and we preach it and we entertain with it or whatever. And then we, we wonder why the bride isn't coming out clean, why sin's not not being dealt with why these people are not being victorious over sin, why it's not working. Well, understand this, you guys. Our words are not clean. I don't care how spiritual you are, how many years you've been in ministry. 
Your words are not clean. Even the prophet Isaiah, before God, when he was confronted with God's holiness, he said, oh, woe to me. I am an unclean man, or I am a man of unclean lips. That's what he said, from a people of unclean lips. So even the prophet, okay, said, my lips are unclean. Now, do you guys know what unclean is? Okay, think about anything unclean, all right? Think about, you know, like manure or like dead stuff, you know, like a dead rat. Just take any unclean thing, and, and that's what your words are like, all right? They're unclean. They're not flawless. God's word is perfect, pure, holy water. Now, if you take that perfect, pure, holy water and you mix it with a dead rat, okay, <laughs> or uh, a little bit of manure, all right, that's what it's like when we mix our words with God's words. And then you know what we do? We take that mixture and, and we try to wash the bride with it. And we can't figure out why she's not coming out clean. The reason she's not coming out clean, guys, is because we are adding our own unclean thing to that pure water. We need to take our words out and we need to speak the word of God to the bride. God's word has the power. It has the spirit of God. It has the anointing of God. Okay? And it has the power to demolish the, the, the strongholds that are in the bride of Christ. Just as it says in 2 Timothy 2, 15 through 16, we need to do our best to present ourselves to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth and we're to avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. So if you get anything out of this, I want you to get this. We need to get rid of our own words, our own swords, our own ways of waging war, and we need to go with God's word. When we speak God's word and when we let it do its work in our hearts, the result is going to be that Christ is going to present us before God as a pure and holy and blameless perfect bride. I will see you guys again next week and in the meantime, be blessed. (laughs) 